I waited so long for this laptop to be released and finally it arrived. It's a 14-inch 2021 MacBook M1 Pro. I've been using this laptop for the past three months for absolutely everything I do. Data analysis, programming, studying and creative work like video editing. I've been absolutely loving it and I really think I got the most bang for my buck with this laptop in terms of all the aspects I care about, performance, aesthetics and convenience. Hi everyone and welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Tufu, I'm a data science consultant. In today's video, I'll talk about my experience with this laptop switching from a Windows laptop and I also give you some notes explanation about what kind of specs you should look out for in a laptop for data science in general and why they matter so that you can judge if it's a good laptop to buy without even have to look at all the laptop benchmarks. Just a side note, this video is not sponsored by Apple or any other companies. As a data analyst slash data scientist, I want a laptop that's fast and reliable for running Python, R, Excel, Tableau, or data analysis and machine learning. I often work in multiple applications at the same time. For example, I might have both R and Python running for two different projects while working on visualization in Tableau or editing videos. This is also because data science projects often involve a lot of different smaller tasks, lots of iterations, investigations, and debugging. So I often have a lot of projects open on my laptop for several days. And this MacBook M1 Pro has been really impressive in terms of performance. It's really, really fast. And this is coming from someone who would get really grumpy for waiting for more than five seconds for RStudio or JupyterLab to spin up. And this was very often the case for me when working on my old Windows laptop, even though it also has pretty decent specs with 16 gigabyte memory and Intel Core i7 processor. That's why switching to this MacBook has been a total game changer for me. With no exaggeration, it significantly improved my quality of life. In addition, I often work with relatively large data sets for data analysis and machine learning for my study and also for my personal projects. For example, for this project about sentiment analysis of Yelp reviews, the review data set is more than 5 gigabytes. And it took me just 7.45 microseconds to load on this laptop in Python versus 1.37 milliseconds on my old Windows laptop. So it's 184 times faster. On the millisecond scale, it might be unnoticeable for humans, but I found that adding all these little things together, it does make a big difference. For training machine learning models, I can usually do it on my laptop with no problem and I can also do some basic deep learning as well. For another project which is a midterm assignment of the artificial intelligence module in my study, I had to run a simulation in Python using a genetic algorithm to produce creatures that can actually move around. This simulation is very intensive because it involves tweaking all the parameters for all the joints and shapes of all the different parts of the creatures and there are thousands of different creatures in this simulation. And this laptop was a beast. It just ran very fast and even after five hours, I still couldn't hear any fan noise. The laptop only heated up a little bit. Really impressive. So you may be wondering, what makes a computer faster and more powerful than another? How much can you trust when someone says a computer is fast? Those are very good questions. And I want to do a little deep dive here to help you understand how different specs of a computer determine its performance. And I believe that this knowledge is generally useful for people like us, data analysts or data scientists who often work with a lot of data and also do programming in their job. But let's forget all the hype and fancy laptop benchmarks for a second and go back to the fundamental understanding of how computers work. Essentially, within a computer, we have the CPU or central processing unit connected to the main memory or random access memory RAM through the buses. The buses work pretty much the same as the buses we see every day on the roads for transportation. They are a collection of wires that transfer data from one place to another. And in this case, they transfer the data and computer instructions between the CPU and the main memory. Connected to this central bus are the controllers that coordinate the data transfer between the RAM and other peripheral devices of a computer like the monitor, keyboard, and disk drive. The CPU is a processor, like the brain of a computer. It does all the data calculation and manipulation and coordinate computer activities, but it doesn't really remember anything. On the other hand, the main memory or the RAM stores the data and instructions that can be used by the CPU. It's simply a compact waffle consisting of billions of memory cells, and each cell stores one byte. Now, when you load in a 5 gigabyte dataset in Python, for example, the the data will first be loaded in the main memory. Your Python code for data preprocessing and manipulation will also be stored in the memory. All this information will be transferred to the CPU to do calculation, and when it's done, the results will be transferred back to the memory. So looking at this, you can probably guess what are the factors that will determine how fast our Python code will run, if at all. The first factor will be how fast the 
computer can read and write data from the hard drive into the memory. This is done via direct memory access, which is a bit deeper into computer architecture, so I'll leave it for now. Secondly, it's a memory size. If your memory size is only 4GB, it will not be able to load the dataset at all. So no matter how fast your CPU is, small RAM means that you can't even load the data in the first place. Even with 8GB, the computer will still struggle quite a bit because it also needs to handle other applications on your computer as well. So the larger your RAM is, the more data it can handle, and the more your computer can juggle between multiple applications. This is why I would generally recommend data analysts and data scientists to get a laptop with at least 16GB memory, especially if working with big data projects like this and juggling between multiple applications are what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's say now the data is successfully loaded into the memory. Now the next thing that will determine how fast your Python code will run are the bus speed and the CPU speed. The memory bus speed together with the memory bus bandwidth will determine how much data can be transferred between the memory and the CPU per second. This is pretty much like how you can transport more goods with bigger roads and faster trucks. This MacBook M1 Pro has a memory bandwidth of 200GB per second. This means that data can be transferred at a rate of 200GB per second between the CPU and the memory. But I feel like this should be called the memory speed instead of the memory bandwidth, I'm not sure. Any hardcore tech fan or computer engineering major watching this video, please help me confirm if this is true. Remember when I said earlier that the CPU only calculates things and doesn't remember anything? It's actually not entirely accurate. The CPU also contains some memory cells to help it temporarily store data fetched from the main memory so that it doesn't have to transfer the data back and forth to the main memory all the time. In addition, the CPU also has a small but high-speed memory portion called the cache memory. It basically stores a copy of the most frequently used data and instructions of the main memory at a given moment. So the size of the cache memory also strongly determines how fast the CPU is. Actually, the cache size and the memory bus speed can be more important to computer performance than the CPU speed. So this is the cache memory of the MacBook M1 Pro. L1, L2, and L3 are the different types of cache. You can see that it's significantly bigger than those of the MacBook M1, but not that much different compared to the M1 Max. I guess that's one of the reasons why the Apple M1 Max doesn't outperform its Pro brother very significantly. But of course, the speed of the CPU is also important too. The Apple M1 Pro chip has a frequency of 3.22 GHz, meaning that its CPU can perform 3.22 billion cycles per second, which is similar to the Apple M1 Max. This MacBook M1 Pro model has an 8-core CPU. It means that the chip on this laptop has 8 independent CPUs with shared cache memory. And of course, the more cores the computer has, the more calculations it can handle in parallel. There's also a higher spec of this MacBook M1 Pro with a 10-core CPU, so it might run 20 to 30% faster than this MacBook for some really intensive tasks. But to pay almost 300 euros extra for that occasional improvement in the performance, I think it may not be worth it. Well, in the future, I may change my mind and especially if I have more money to burn on this thing, I'll probably consider it. We'll see. <laughs> this computer has 512GB storage, which in hindsight is a bit small for me as I also edit videos and they usually take a large amount of storage space, especially that I have to repeat every sentence literally five times or so because I stutter so much. But since I store most of my data on Google Drive or iCloud, it's not really an issue and this way is probably more sustainable in long term than storing everything on the laptop. Next to the performance, I also care a lot about the aesthetics of the laptop. If it's my work laptop, I don't particularly care. But if it's my personal computer, I just feel more inspired by a computer that's nicely designed. The edges of the screen is very small and it looks very pro. One thing I really like about this laptop is the screen display. The display is very sharp. With this high resolution screen display, it's also a treat when watching videos or movies. The touchpad of this laptop and I guess of any Mac MacBook in general is freaking awesome. The smooth scrolling is very easy on the eyes and I notice I can work longer with this laptop without tiring my eyes. Talking about convenience, if you're an iPhone or iPad user, getting a Mac is a no-brainer. I really regret I waited so long to switch to a MacBook even though I've been using iPhone and iPad Pro for all my life. For example, I usually take handwritten notes on my iPad like what I'm doing now and then I'll transfer them to my laptop with AirDrop and then store them on Notion, for example. 
example. In addition, with a large touchpad, I don't feel like I really need a mouse for this laptop unless I'm doing something like video editing or playing games. So it's really convenient when I'm traveling and the long battery life of this laptop, about 15 hours, also makes me feel more comfortable bringing this laptop with me to a coffee shop or something and work there for a few hours. This laptop also has an HDMI cable that allows you to connect to a monitor and it also has a slot for SDXC card that's also very convenient if you want to transfer files from your camera to your laptop. A slight inconvenience though is that this laptop only has USB-C ports so if you need an USB port you need an adapter. Despite all the nice thing about this laptop it also has its own limitation and they may or may not matter to you. Firstly you cannot use Power BI on a Mac without a virtual machine. I personally don't use Power BI in my personal projects as I prefer doing dashboarding in Tableau or Python or R but if you do use Power BI in your project that could be a consideration for you. The next limitation of this MacBook is that if you really want to train deep learning models you probably need to get a laptop with better GPU than what is offered here. I say usually it's best to turn to cloud services for training deep learning models or working with very very large data sets. I'm so happy I finally made a video to nerd out about how much I like this laptop. I can't recommend it enough to any data analyst or data scientist out there who are looking to improve or upgrade their workflow. And by the way, I also want to say thank you for all your support. This channel has reached 10,000 subscribers, which is beyond my imagination. And to be honest with you, it's been quite overwhelming keeping up with all your comments and emails. In the next video, I'll do a little Q&A on the channel so that you can get to know a little bit more about myself. Anyway, if you like this video, don't forget to smash the like button and let me know in the comment section below what questions you have and what you want me to talk about next. With that, I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye!